Hey family, thank you so much for joining us today. We really hope that this message blesses your hearts. Before you hear this powerful teaching, I wanna encourage you to do two things. First of all, share this message with someone who needs to hear the gospel message. The second thing is, if this ministry has been a blessing to you, I wanna encourage you to give back to the work of the Lord. It's very safe and simple. You can go to our app or you can go to our website, cfmiami.org slash give. Well, I hope you enjoy this message. God bless you. Hey, church family. Man, aren't you blessed, as a song said, that he took the fall for you and for me, that he thought about you above it all, amen? Can we give another shout of praise to our God? Hey, well, welcome everyone. Great to see you. My name is Omar, and I have the honor and the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here at Christ Fellowship. And if you're joining us today for the very first time, either at home or at one of our campuses, listen, we are just so excited that you decided to join us. Today's a great day because this weekend we are, uh, it's October 31st, and we know that the world celebrates Halloween. But for the church, it's actually a very special day. Not because we celebrate Halloween per se, but because it is Reformation Day. Yeah. You see, 500 years ago, the church went through a reformation. And out of the reformation came out five fundamental truths, or what they called it, five solas, that really shaped our faith, the, found the fundamentals of what we believe. And so today, we are starting this brand new series that I'm excited to dive in. The first sola that we're going to talk about, and that is grace alone. And so, hey, I'm ready and excited to dive into God's Word. Are you all too? Yeah? And so wherever you find yourself, open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. You can say, standing as I read God's Word. Listen to what it says. Now, for by what? For, for what? Grace. Yeah, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. In other words, embedded in this verse are some of the five truths that are fundamental to our Christian faith. Amen. You can go and take a seat, everybody, at all campuses. And let me start off by sharing this with you. You know, many of you know that growing up, I grew up in this little town in northern Miami called Miami Springs. It's just north of the airport. And inside of that little town, there is a beautiful golf course. And you know, when I was young, I would go out there with my cousins and with my, uh, my friends, and we would just go out there as kids, and we would just play golf and hit it, and we'd just run around and just have a really great time. And since then, I played golf sporadically, not often. But just recently, I found out that some of the guys here at church played golf. And so I said, you know what? Man, I would love to go out there with them and just play a little bit. So I started playing with them. And I quickly realized, man, I need to get better because these guys are good. And so I called my cousin Stephen, who is a great, great golfer, and I said, hey, Steve, do you mind coming with me to the, to the practice range and just showing me, you know, adjusting my swing? I think I got a pretty good swing. But, man, I, I, I need you to come and just give me those little nuggets, those, those little tweaks to my swing. And he was gracious enough, and he came out to the practice range. We were there. And I get there, and I'm all excited and set up, and I'm ready to show him my, my amazing swing. And so I, I, I start swinging, and I start hitting balls. And folks, after the first swing, he said, wait, 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 wait a second, Omar. Listen, you're doing everything absolutely wrong. And I'm like, what? What? My, my no, 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 yeah, you're doing everything absolutely wrong wrong. And here's what he helped me under, understand, that every single person, when they start playing golf, when they approach the game of golf, they never swing the proper way right from the start. Why? Because every single person approaches the golf swing with the, the wrong preconceived ideas of what the proper swing is. 
And so everyone just goes up there and starts swinging the way they think in their mind is the right way. And folks, for many years, I would swing the golf, the golf, cl- the, the, the golf club, but I would never really, uh, you know, improve in my game. Uh, I can never find any consistency. And because of it, I, I never really truly enjoyed the game of golf. So he began to teach me some of the fundamentals of the game of golf, of, of the swing. And primarily, he began to teach me from this little book called Ben Hogan's Five Lessons. Five Lessons. And if you're a golfer, maybe you've heard of this, but in this little tiny book, Ben Hogan actually covers five fundamentals of the proper golf swing. Yeah, and they are meticulous. In fact, he will, the first lesson, it's all about the grip. There's a specific grip that you need to hold. The golf course is not just holding any other way. There's a specific way that you stand in front of the ball. There's a specific way that you swing it backwards, then you swing it frontwards, and the way that you finish. And, and here's what Stephen told me. Listen, Omar, if you are able to embrace and internalize these five fundamental principles of the golf swing, little by little, you will see improvement. In fact, just so you have a visual of what the perfect golf swing looks like, just take a look at the perfect swing from Ben Hogan himself. It's a thing, a thing of beauty, right? And, and, but here's what I want you to, to understand. I came to a point in my life, in my golf life, right, that I realized that I could not continue, right? I could not continue with the same swing, with the things that I think. And by the way, listen, I still stink, by the way. I'm never a good, you know, Pastor Al calls it straight trash. Man, I, I, I still, now I'm not a good golfer. But, but I had to come to the realization that if I wanted to improve in the game of golf, I could not keep going with what I thought was the proper swing. Instead, I had to really embrace these new fundamentals that sometimes didn't even make sense. Because once I was able to embrace these five fundamentals, then I would be able to uh, improve in my, go- in my golf game, I would be able to find some sort of consistency, and I would finally be able to enjoy this game called golf. And church family, let me just bring all that whole idea over to our teaching for today because what an image of how many people approach a relationship with God. And by that I mean that just like every golfer, right, approaches the golf game with the wrong preconceived ideas, just like that. And here's the main idea as we start this series. Every person that approaches a relationship with God always approaches God with, first of all, the wrong preconceived idea of who God is, and also the wrong preconceived idea of what the true gospel is. And and because of it, there's so many people that try to start a relationship with God. They they, They try to start this journey with God but they never get to a point that they uh, mature in their walk with the Lord, that they find consistency in their walk, and they never truly experience the joy of the walk of a walk with Christ. But here's the good news. Just like Ben Hogan has, what, five lessons? Listen, in God's Word, there are five fundamental truths that if you're able to embrace these truths, even when they don't make total sense, listen, you will see your walk with the Lord flourish like never before. And who knows, maybe you're out there right now watching, and you're thinking, oh, man, I'm tracking with you because I've come to church here and there. You know, that's my first time here, or I've tried the God thing. But you know what? I, every time that I've tried it, I've, I've never really, I really grown. I, I, don't, I don't really see myself, you know, being consistent. I don't see myself with the joy that I see people here with. So, so what are these five fundamental truths that will really help me flourish in my walk with the Lord? Well, we're going to find out in this series as we start off this series called The Five Solas, all right? So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, 
And uh, you can also open up your apps. You can follow along there with us. And today I have two thoughts for us about the first fundamental truth that we're going to cover in this series, all right? So write this down as point number one. The first thought is that you are saved by God's grace alone, alone. Now, family, let's go to the passage for today and listen to what it says. It says, for by what? Come on, you can do a little louder than that. Yes, there we go. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Now, pause right there for a moment, because this verse is not only one of the most famous passages in Scripture, it's also one of the most foundational passages as well, because this simple verse reveals to us what is the, the cause or what is the reason for our salvation, and that is that we are saved by God's grace alone. You see, a fundamental position of the Christian faith, if you're joining us recently, is that every single person, whether they realize it or not, are in desperate need of saving, specifically saving from our sin and the consequences of our sin. In fact, listen to what uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, just in the same chapter, just a few verses before, Listen to what God's Word says about your, your condition and my condition before we came to know Christ. Listen to what it says. It says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. See, church, Scripture is very clear that the biggest problem that humanity has today is not COVID, it's not this pandemic, it's not inflation, it's not supply shortages, right? It's not politics, but rather it is our sin and the eternal death that we deserve because of our sin. That is the greatest problem that humanity has. You see, being God, and God being a loving God, listen, has always planned from the beginning to save us from our sin. And this passage teaches us that the reason, the reason that God, that God saved us was because of his grace. Now circle the word grace right there in your Bible if you have it open. Because the word grace there in the original text, you know, the Bible was first written in Greek and Hebrew and then translated into different languages. The word grace in the original language simply means this. It, seem, it, it means unmerited favor, unmerited favor, or another way of putting it, is undeserved loving kindness. So every time that you read the word grace in God's word, which is all over the place, remember this. This means favor that I did not receive, that I did not deserve, or loving kindness that God showed me that we did not deserve. And so the key operative word there is unmerited and undeserved. See, what we've seen here is that God's action to save you and to save me, listen, was not generated by anything else other than God's grace and God's favor he had on you that you did not deserve. Amen? Yeah, we can clap for God's grace about that. And so you see, the early church, when the church first started 2,000 years ago, listen, the church was very clear on this critical foundational truth. But after 1,500 years, listen, this truth, this truth began to be lost. You see, the medieval church at that time was riddled with doctrines, with uh, traditions, uh, with rituals that were not truly found in God's Word. And so a group of men called the Reformers, led by Martin Luther, many of you have heard that name, right, Martin Luther, Listen, they fought with everything they had for these 
for these, for these pure truth, and one of those truths that they fought for was that we are saved by God's grace alone, or in the Latin, in the Latin it's sola gratia, right? And so the word here, right, the idea, this is what, one of the foundational truth that they fought for. Sola means uh, alone, and then gratia means grace in the Latin. And folks, as they argued that we were saved by grace alone, here's what they also emphasize. Write this down as letter A. That you are not saved by your works. By your works. Now, let's go back to the verse for a moment. Listen to what it says. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of what, church family? Like what? Works. Yeah, of works. Now, if you have your Bibles open or you're taking notes in your apps, just circle the word works for just a moment. Because the word there works in the original text is the Greek word ergon. And ergon is a very simple, common word that simply means a, a, an action or a deed. So church, here's what the medieval church was teaching. That unless you did some sort of action, listen carefully, Unless you took some sort of action, God would not, sh would not bestow grace upon you. So, for example, unless you did some sort of ritual or tradition when you were a child or something like that, that God would not take that step and show you grace. That unless you did some sort of moral action or something that dictated by the church, that God would not show you grace. That unless you obeyed a specific thing in God's word, then God would not show you grace. Or even that if you did not give money to the church, that God would not show you grace. You see, in other words, what they were, what they were teaching is that God's grace needed to be kick-started by something that you did. And then here's what was terrible. That even if you did these things, right, down the line... If you messed up in any way, you fell away from God's grace. And church, listen, this is in direct opposition to God's holy word. Amen? Because if we had to do something, think about, think about it like this. If we had to do anything, right, to motivate God to show us grace, then it becomes merited and no longer grace. See that works? If you have to do anything, right, for God to be moved to show you grace, then what? It's no longer true grace. It's no longer unmerited. It's no longer undeserved. And church family, the reformers 500 years ago, they fought for these truths. And not only does that mean that we're not saved by our works, but here's another aspect of it. Write this down as letter B, that you are not saved by your faith. Now, before some of you scream heresy for a moment, just listen carefully. Let's go, God, let's go to the text. I want to show you something, a little nuance, so you have clarity here. Listen to what it says. It says, for, what's the next word? For by grace, you have been saved through faith. You know, I think that we have become so accustomed to connecting our faith and our salvation that a misconception along the way has taken place. And the, mis and the, mis and the, and the mistake is to think that our, that, our, that our faith is the basis or the reason for our salvation. But folks, notice what the verse says. Because it does, it does not say, for by faith you are saved. It doesn't say that. It says, for by grace you are saved through what? faith. And so here's a simple way for you to kind of sort everything out in your mind of how grace and faith, inter, you know, relate to each other when it comes to your salvation. And that is this, that faith is the instrument, all right, by which you receive your salvation. It's not the cause of your salvation, but rather grace is the cause of of your salvation. Does that make sense? Let me just, just I'm going to repeat it. I want you to process that because it may be a lot to take in, right? Faith is the instrument by which you receive your salvation. 
It is not the cause of it. And then grace, though, it is the cause, the basis of our salvation. Now, the natural question we have, okay, Omar, how then does our faith save us? Like, what does that mean? How, how does that happen? You all, you all ready to find out? Are you all ready? Yes. All right. You got to come back next week for that. <laughs> That's the second truth. We are saved through our faith alone. You got to be back next week. I'm telling you, it's going to be really enlightening for us, all right? Uh, but here's the thing. When you truly understand that our cause for our salvation is God's undeserved love for us, his favor on us, here's what happens. Write this down as big number two. God's grace, you start seeing it as a life-changing gift. See, when you truly understand that, God cho- that when God chose you out of the face of the earth to show you undeserved loving kindness, to show you undeserved merit, you know, when you truly understand what God has done for you, it radically transforms the way you live. And here's the first effect. When God shows you grace, here's the first effect of it. Write this down as letter A. God's grace gives you, first of all, spiritual life. Spiritual life. Now, Listen to what it says back in Ephesians chapter 2, the same chapter, verse 4 and 5. Just listen very carefully here. It says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love, right, the great love that he has for us, even when we were what? Dead. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, in our sins, made us, what's the next word? alive. We were dead. We're now alive together with Christ. And this took place by what? By grace. grace. Man, you're, you guys are tracking along. By grace, you have been saved. Now, let's just pause for a moment and let's look at this concept of being dead in a trespass or spiritually dead. Because I think many people, many believers especially, have heard the term we we're spiritually dead before Christ. But so few actually understand truly what it means to be spiritually dead. You see, spiritually dead implies that there's nothing in us, in our sinful nature, right, that desires or seeks anything of God. In fact, God's Word says in Romans chapter 3, verse 11, it says this. It says, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands and no one what? No one what? No one seeks for God. Folks, what an indictment. We are all sinners. None of us are righteous. And none of us seek for God. And so let me just give you a quick visual to help help you further understand what it means to be spiritually dead, all right? You know, many of us, unfortunately, we probably have been to a funeral and we have, you know, been before a casket of someone who's, been, who's passed away. And church, one characteristic, characteristic of someone who, ha, who is physically dead is that they are not sensitive to any spiritual stimuli. Think about this, right? Because you can stand right in front of someone who has passed away and you can scream in their ear. You can (laughs) clap right over them. You can get a bucket of ice water and dump it over that dead body, and you know what? They're not going to move a muscle. Why? Because part of being physically dead is that you are unable to really respond to any physical stimuli. And, And church, it's the same idea when it comes to being spiritually dead. Because a person who is spiritually dead... Does not, does not have any desire, does not want anything to do with the things of God. They don't seek God, and they don't respond to any, to any spiritual stimuli. But folks, when God's grace comes upon a person, listen, and God's grace comes upon them, listen, he gives them now new life, new life. And folks, this is where the idea of being born again comes from. You know, we've all heard of being a born again Christian, right? We've all heard of that. 
You know, the idea then is when, when that, that someone, when God approaches and shows them grace, they now begin to have spiritual life, and now there's a desire in them to know God and to seek for more of God. In fact, this is so important to be born again, that Jesus in the gospel said that a person cannot enter into the kingdom of God unless they are what? Born again. Now, how is a person born again? What, how is a person's spirit goes from being dead to alive? Listen, that is a mystery. In fact, there is a famous passage in Scripture, John chapter 3, if you read that passage, where the Lord Jesus Christ is having a conversation with this man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a, uh, a, a, a religious leader of the time, and he was generally wanting to know what is this whole kingdom of, of God is and how to enter the kingdom of God. And so as he approaches Jesus at night so that no one would see him, right, he's having a, a really great conversation with the Lord. In fact, there is a series called The Chosen. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. That they actually perfectly, I think, encapsulate this scene and this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus where he helps them understand how to enter the kingdom of God and what does it mean to be born again. Just take a look. What have you come here to show us? A kingdom. That is what our rulers are worried about. Not that kind. Then what? A sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. You mean like a new creature? A conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? I hope you don't mean return to the womb because that would be a problem for me. My mother, may she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That part of you, that is what must be reborn to new life. How can these things be? Ah, a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. I know. I know. Do you hear this? What? Listen. What do you hear? The wind. How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. I hear it sound. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the Spirit, you can recognize His effect. Man, don't you love that scene? Yeah. Hey, folks, here's what happens. When the Spirit of God comes into your life, right, and gives you new life, listen, and you are born again. Family, there are visible changes. Something different now is about you. You see, before, think about this, before you were not interested in the things of God. You thought the things of God were, were boring. But now there's a desire in you. You want to know about God. You want to pursue the things of God. Before, you didn't trust the Lord. You trusted in yourself. You trusted in your own abilities. You trusted in your own righteousness. But what? Now, why don't you spirit your life? Now you, don't, you trust the Lord. You rely on the Lord. He is your Lord, right? You, he's, a, he's a sovereign God over your life. Before, you didn't love God. In fact, you might have thought it was foolishness, but once you're spiritually alive, now you have affections for God. You love the Lord. He is your Savior. Everything about your life changes. And folks, this is why maybe you have experienced this. Maybe that's why a group of people could sit down to hear a message or the gospel being shared with them. And, and the group of people walk out together 
And all of them are in faith, they're still not interested in anything, but there's one person that changed. There's a person in that group that changed. And folks, and that's because God at that moment, listen, intervened, the sovereign God intervened at that specific moment for that person. And now they have a desire for God. Now they want to know about God. Now they start pursuing the Lord. You see how it works? And folks, when that happens, then that leads you to put your trust and faith in God. That then leads you to start a journey with God. And there you start an eternal journey with the Lord of glory. And see, folks, just like the wind, like the Lord said in John chapter 3, listen, we can see the visible changes. We may not see it, but we see the effects of it just like that. When the Spirit of God comes upon a person and shows grace and gives them spiritual life, listen, we may not see how it works. It may be a mystery to us, but listen, we can see visibly the changes. Can we not? And folks, as you start now growing your walk with Christ, your faith in God, and you're growing, here's what happens. Write this down as letter B. God's grace produces humility. Humility. You know, there was a situation in the early church where different churches, uh, you know, where there were people who were getting... Um, uh, you know, in favor of one pastor or one church. And so they became prideful against each other. And there was almost like rivalries between different churches. And so when the Apostle Paul heard that they were kind of rivalry against each other and all the way, he writes them a letter and he listens to what he tells them in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says this. It's, he, the, uh, Paul said, listen, that none of you may be what? Puffed up, prideful, in favor of ones against another. For what do you have that you did not receive? If you received it, why do you boast if you did not, as if you did not receive it? In other words, Paul was helping them understand that Nothing apart from God's grace. Listen, we cannot receive anything apart from God's grace. From your salvation, to your, to your walk with the Lord, to your understanding of God's word, to all every spiritual blessing, everything is due to God's grace upon us, His un our undeserved, um, unmerited favor, undeserved loving kindness. And so he's saying, man, why are you guys rivalry? Why are you guys talking bad about that pastor, about that church? Why are you prideful against each other? Because everything ultimately is due to God's grace. And you know what's sad? And as a leader, I get to see some of this. It's sad that in some in church circles, there are some who say they truly understand God's grace. But some of those people are the ones who are uh, the most prideful and the most arrogant against other churches and other believers. And, and they talk bad about them, and they don't talk kindly. And here's what happens. They look down at other pastors and other churches like if they're the ones that got it all figured out, and they're the ones they look down on them with, with pride. And church, listen. The reality is, when I see that, and they say they understand grace, they, don't, they might understand intellectually the concept of grace, but grace has not transformed their heart. Because when they truly understand that everything we have, everything we know, is all because God showed grace upon us, listen, it should create natural humility in your heart. Amen? And so church, listen, my, my desire of Christ fellowship, listen carefully. Listen, we know, we are confident in what we believe in God's word. We know what we believe. We stand firm in it. But listen, let's always be a church that when we look at other churches, other denominations, other pastors, listen, we look always in humility. Amen? Because everything is ultimately by God's grace. And so listen, when you understand that this of uh, God's grace, listen, it begins to transform your heart. It begins to create you humility. And here's another aspect of what happens in your life when you experience God's grace. Write this down as letter C. Listen, God's grace moves you to serve him and others. Amen. Now, listen to what God's word says in 1 Peter chapter 4. Listen to what it says. As each has received a gift, a spiritual gift, that is, right, 
Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied what? Grace. Good stewards of God's grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves as the one who serves by the strength that God supplies, that in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. You see, the clear mark that someone has understood the depth of God's grace in their life is that they begin to naturally want to serve the Lord. Not because they want to repay God, right? That, that, that would nullify grace, but rather because when they realize all of God's grace in their life, they want to be a good steward of God's grace. God has shown me grace, and I just want to serve other people. And folks, here's what the reality is. The opposite must be true as well. Because if you say that you have experienced God's grace in your life, and you're not serving God in any way, Scripture would say that you are being a bad steward of God's grace. Right? If serving God is you being a good steward of God's grace, then conversely, not serving God, then you're a bad steward of God's grace. And so here's what I would just say. Listen, I want to challenge our church family today. Because I know this pandemic has been hard on everyone, right? I know we, we had to slow down for a little bit. I get it. I understand. But listen, if you were serving before the pandemic and you feel good and you're in the right place, listen, man, I want to encourage you, man, get reconnected to, a, to the ministry you used to serve. Start serving again. Start being a good steward of God's very grace in your life. And if you've never served Maybe there's an awakening for you that, listen, God's not calling you to come into full-time ministry, but God is asking you to be a good steward of His grace and to serve whichever way possible, right? And folks, when we talk about serving God, it's not talking about doing a kind deed at work or doing something like that. No, listen, when we talk about spiritual gifts, it's for the edification of the body to serve each other, right, within the context of the body of Christ. And listen, at Christ Fellowship, we are so committed to helping you being a good steward of God's grace. That's why we have so many ministries make it so easy for you to serve. Whether you can serve in kids' ministry, you can serve in student ministry. Listen, you can serve in uh, guest services, you can serve in parking, uh, listen, you can serve in production, worship. There's so many different ministries here for you to serve. And so I want to challenge you, listen, if you have not served, if you're not serving, or you say, you know what, I would like to start getting more information about getting more involved, just go to cfmiami.org slash serve and we'll connect you to one of the ministry teams and we'll find a place that at your time and where you can serve at your schedule, then you can start serving the Lord as he's asked you to. And there's another, and, and there's another opportunity though, because just in a few weeks, listen, Thanksgiving is coming, right? And there's a lot of under-resourced people in this city. And one of the things that we love to do here is serve our community. In fact, just up, up, in a few couple of weeks, we're gonna have our next big serve day. And that's going to be a time that we all get together at our campuses. We assemble a Thanksgiving meals together. Uh, we get them all ready to go. We get the different families. And we go to these homes and we give them a box ready for them to have Thanksgiving meal. We love on the people. We encourage them. We share the gospel with them. We pray with them. We invite them to church. Whatever the case may be. And so listen, I want to challenge you. Listen, our entire church, listen, we are all called to be good stewards of God's grace. Amen? So I want to challenge us, listen, on November 13, here at every single one of our campuses, in the morning, a few hours, man, come out with your entire family, with your little ones, show them what it means to serve the Lord. I am telling you, there's no way that you're going to go home and feel like you wasted your time. You, you never waste your time when you're serving the living God, amen? And so I want to challenge you to sign up and be, and be part of this. Simply go to the website behind me or just take a, a, a screenshot of, that, um, of the QR code. You'll get a link and we'll get you signed up. But I'm telling you, come out that day. It's going to be a real blessing for the people of the city. Let's be good stewards of God's grace. Amen. And let me end with this. You know, maybe you're here today watching us online. Maybe you're at one of our campuses. And, you know, you maybe came in for the first time. Maybe you're here because you brought your kid to Candy Palooza and they're having a blast right now. But you're sitting here right now, and as you're sitting, 
You came in without a desire for God. You didn't want nothing to do with God. You're just here just to, because someone invited you, but something happened when you were sitting here or you're watching. Something happened that now there's, you feel God stirring your heart to want to pursue things of God. You want to know more about God. There's something in you that's happening. Listen, if you're feeling something right now, listen, don't ignore it. That is God's grace upon your life. And so I want to challenge you, if you're feeling this way, you're watching at home and you're thinking, my goodness, I, I got I to gotta get right with God. I got to start with my walk with God. Don't ignore it. That is God's grace. And, and, and you may be wondering, well, Omar, okay, I'm feeling this right now. I'm feeling it. I, I need to get right with God. I need to start this journey. How do I do that? Listen, we already know. It's not by works. But it's simply by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, in the same passage, Nicodemus, that we saw that, 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 that scene, Right after that, Jesus tells Nicodemus one of the most famous Bible verses ever, and that is this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, the way you want to start a relationship with God, you want to get right with God, you want to experience forgiveness of sin for the very first time, it's so simple. It's simply about you putting, surrendering your life and putting your faith in Jesus Christ. The question is, will you take that step and put your faith in him? Let's bow for a head for prayer. Father, we come before you and we're grateful as we start this series that, Lord, that we are saved by your grace alone. God, thank you, God, for giving us spiritual life. Lord, thank you for moving in our lives, interceding in our lives. Father, thank you for creating humility in us. And Father, help us to serve you the way that you envisioned. And with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, listen, if you're someone here today that says, you know, Pastor, I may not have all this squared away, I may not understand, but I know that I need the Lord, and I'm ready to put my faith and my trust in Christ. Listen, if that's you, before I lead you, in a few moments I'm going to lead you through a prayer, but I want to just be able just to pray and see the people who are ready to take that step of faith. And so with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, with no one looking around, listen, if that's you, I want to challenge you right now. No one looking around, just slip up your hand with, and just say, hey, Omar, just pray for me because I'm ready to, to start a relationship with God. Is there anybody here today that says, Pastor, just pray for me. I, I'm ready to start a relationship with Christ. Anybody? I see you. Anybody else? I see you as well. Anybody else? Anybody else? If you're online, if you're watching, go ahead and just make a comment right there in the comments so we can follow up with it. Listen, whether you raise your hand or not, here's what I want. I want to lead you through a prayer, and you know what's going on in your life. And so when you pray this prayer, listen, you don't pray this to me. I cannot save you. I'm simply, man, you pray this to the God who loves you, who died on a cross for you, and is ready to give, to give you a brand new life. So if that's you, pray this with me. Father, today I realize, Lord, that I need you more than anything in life. And Father, today I'm experiencing the grace already, your grace. And there's a desire in me, there's a contrition in my heart right now about my sin. And so Lord, I come before you and I confess my sin before you. I put my trust in you, O oh Lord. And Father, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. And so Lord, today I give my life to you. And for the rest of my life, O oh Lord, Help me to live a life that reflects, oh God, the grace that you've shown in my life today, oh Lord. Thank you, Father, for loving me, for showing kindness to me, and for saving me today. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's people say, amen. Hey, can we give it up for those who came to know Christ today? Listen, if you're at one of our campuses, I want to challenge you. It's a special day. Before you go, stop by the next step booth. We have a little gift for you, a Bible. Just help us connect with you so we can help you take steps in your walk with the Lord. Or if you're watching online, go to our, go to our website, cfmiami.org slash connect. Go to that website, fill out that form, and one of our pastors will reach out to you, and we will help you get started on this new journey, all right? Well, I'm going to call all campus pastors to the front. Hey, be back next week for the second fundamental truth of the five souls. Amen. God bless you.